Joy Catherine McPhail arrived on the political scene in BC fresh from the labour movement in Ontario, determined to stand up for the rights of working people. One of her first assignments was to be the spokesperson for the BC Federation of Labour. She started talking and people started listening to her. That's because you simply can't ignore her energy. She radiates enthusiasm and delivers compelling messages, all with a sparkle in her eye and a ready and cheerful grin and piercing insights. Her life and career are the stuff of Hollywood stories, or at least they caught the eye of a Hollywood executive. Thank you, Joy, for this conversation. Really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, you have always said that you knew that you would be involved in the labor movement. How did you know that as a young person? Uh, I'm one of four children. My mom had four of us in 49 months, working class family. Uh, so you had to advocate your way out of any situation in order to get your position uh, on the record. So that was uh, part of my roots. But both my parents were active in the uh, trade union movement. My dad was a construction worker and was a member of the operating engineers. And then my mom, who was a registered nurse, um, helped form the first uh, nurses union called the Ontario Nurses Association um, in Hamilton. So it was in your blood. It was in the blood. We got the magazines. Uh, going off to uh, union meetings was part of my... Up, uh, my parents going off to union meetings was as much a part of my upbringing as going off to church. And so you wanted to pursue education in this field. Uh, that couldn't have been easy for you. I got to university doing night courses and I fell in love with economics. And through that, um, the study of economics, a lot of my world was explained about my upbringing, about the community I lived in, um, how, how certain wages were available to me and weren't, others weren't. So that was it, economics. And then decided on the London School of Economics. I mean, how prominent and what a wonderful place to go. My first uh, 48 hours of attending classes at the London School of Economics were a disaster because I couldn't understand anybody. They were all speaking English, but with heavy working class accents, northern accents, a cockney, <laughs> and then I'll, and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to go home because I can't say, could you please speak English? They were speaking English. Kicked in after 48 hours, and uh, I never looked back. And so, and so coming out of that education, did you know you wanted to be a negotiator, a labor negotiator? Uh, I knew I wanted to work for the labor movement, for the union movement. Uh, I, I thought uh, it would be very interesting to be a negotiator, but I was willing to do whatever it took to uh, work for the labor movement. Anyway, I got a job in Sault Ste. Marie, and it was an all-purpose union uh, job that I got. I had to do everything, including negotiations. Fell in love with it. Fell in love with negotiations. Shortly after being uh, promoted from Sault Ste. Marie to Thunder Bay, uh, I moved to uh, British Columbia, and we all know in British Columbia that the labor movement is uh, much more entrenched than other parts of the country, that it's robust, and uh, was in my time there, and I, I, I think it's still this, the same, a very progressive movement. And so I joined a union, the BC General Services Union, but in that days it was called the BC Government Employees Union, and there were lots of women working there. It was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful to be amongst colleagues who were women. And then you decided to go into politics. Was that something that had been in your mind for a long time? As soon as I moved out to uh, British Columbia, I became involved in uh, the NDP as a backroom girl in those days, he uh, heavily involved in um, campaigns up to and including running uh, campaigns. I um, contributed a lot to the policy side of uh, the party in those days. And no, it never occurred to me to actually put my name forward for a nomination. And an old time NDPer, Bob Williams, decided to retire from the seat. And it was pretty clear that the NDP was going to form government. This was in nine, late nine, 1990, early 1991. 
And uh, we looked around, the party looked around and said, my gosh, there's only uh, two women in the 10 seats in Vancouver who are running for us. Uh, Joy, you, you should run. And I went, N I don't think so. Uh, I'm not ready. You know, I don't know enough, even though I'd been active for a dozen years in politics. Anyway, I, I ran uh, with the encouragement of uh, family and friends. And uh, I won on the second ballot by five votes. <laughs> I was called Landslide McPhail. Think of how important those five votes right. were to the rest of your life. Exactly. Five people uh, changed my life. And so, of course, you ran and got elected. Yes, uh, and we did form government. Mike Harcourt was the leader and uh, became premier at the time. Um, we got elected in October of 1991, and that was my first election. Now, you had all that experience as in labor negotiations, but also the back room of politics, as you've said, but you were a backbencher. Did that sort of surprise you? <laughs> yes, I thought for sure that not only should I be in cabinet, but really I could probably be premier too, with no experience whatsoever. After about two months of actually doing the job of being an MLA, I was ever grateful to the wisdom of Mike Harcourt to not put me in cabinet and to allow me to learn the complexities of being an elected person, the complexities of the legislature, the complexities of being in, um, having a strong opposition. Uh, so I was ever grateful for the time to actually learn the job. The cheekiness of me in those days was quite amazing. And we were met with some very difficult, uh, challenging issues uh, immediately, particularly around the war in the woods. So um, that, uh, that surprised me about how thoughtful we had to be, diligent and um, uh, slow, slow about making change, because so many hundreds and thousands of families would be affected by that. The economy would be affected by any change that was brought about. And on the other hand, it surprised me to have state power. I don't know any other way to describe it. Uh, sounds almost communist. I don't mean that. But a state to have state power and understand that you can make change. It was it was uh, deeply moving and an eye-opener. Joy, you were so many ministries, the head of um, various ones, including finance, of course, but was there one that stands out in your mind that you feel that you had the most influence as cabinet minister or did the most important things? It's not part of my normal uh, uh, persona for people to think about me as being minister of social services or for me to talk about it, but it was my favorite ministry where I got to uh, make change that was needed in the area of both financial welfare and child welfare. An example? Well, um, in the area of um, financial welfare, we brought in the child benefit, uh, which is now represent, re replicated across Canada, both at the federal level and in other provinces. It's a benefit for families where, uh, depending on your, um, well, no, hardly depending on anything, just you, you get it to raise your children in a way that is meaningful for those who are low and middle income. And that took us a long time because, as you know, Carol, as a former finance minister, the, those items are big cost items when you're talking about every family gets it of a certain income, every child gets it, and yet it makes such a difference to the lives of children. What about the other side of the coin? Any big frustration or disappointment of something you couldn't get through? Oh, yeah, lots. And I've blocked them all from my memory. <laughs> but, but yes, there were um, disappointments. Um, uh, let me think. Education. I was Minister of Education. 
I would have liked to have done more to entrench solid, uh, sustainable terms for smaller class sizes and um, a greater um, support for educators in the classroom. What was the block? Uh, we were very far down in the polls. We knew we were going to lose the election. The um, uh, then opposition knew not to, uh, uh, not to lend us any support in that area. Teachers were cranky, wanted more. And uh, there was just no, there was no universal will to get it done. I, I was hoping that we could have even done, um, got in universal um, uh, kindergarten, all day kindergarten, which is now in place, but no, we couldn't. It, it, was, it was almost like the wounds around, uh, in my government were too big at the time to allow us to have any sort of achievement. And as you say, lost the election. That's a polite word for it. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> a massacre, an absolute <laughs> massacre. And uh, my political party, the NDP, was reduced to two. Jenny Kwan and I were elected. Now, we were the very first 100% female caucus in the Westminster system. <laughs> two of us. And 77 liberals that, were elected. That must have been a challenge. You know, I think I had post-traumatic stress disorder for at least the first 24 months. Uh, in fact, I know I did. I do recall being in a, uh, a, a days of fear uh, a lot of the time. Fear about the responsibility and not being able to achieve it, not being able to live up to it, I should say, um, and uh, fear that my party would disappear uh, fear that we were going to, Jenny and I were going to miss uh, uh, issues that were going to be a, affect so many people. And, and it was um, physically brutal. We had to debate in the legislature for seven, eight hours a day, and then on the weekends, or, or, and then in the evenings prepare, early in the mornings prepare, meet with people who had issues, because we were the opposition. And then um, on weekends, we had to share the duties of traveling the province to try to rebuild the NDP. Yes, from the outside, you look constantly strong and on top of everything, and yet you're saying you were really in some sort of fog. Would you say you were depressed that for the first couple of years? Uh, n uh, no, depressed isn't the right... No, d I definitely would not say depressed, but uh, afraid. I was afraid a lot of the time. Um, and so that made me nervous, and it affected my sleep, it affected the way I, I was physically. Uh, and of course, I, my son was uh, a youngster during that time. Hard to live in a state of fear, isn't it? Yes, uh, and yet you, you couldn't uh, stop, we couldn't stop. Um, the demands increased uh, every day because the government of the day, you, you came in the term after, but Gordon Campbell's first term was an activist term. He was making change top to bottom. Um, and um, Jenny, it was like drinking from a fire hose to keep up with it. It's, uh, you also mentioned the ugly side of politics, which these days especially is social media. You and I have talked about it. How do you, how do you get good people to run? Oh, Carol, that's such, such a key point. I don't think I could be in politics today. Well, I don't, I, 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 I'm, younger people have to be in politics today than, than I am. Um, but I, I don't think that I would survive in politics because of the constant intrusion of social media and the vicious nature of it. Uh, I just don't, I know I couldn't do it. Um, we both have strong personalities, and that's our strength. But that often proves to be a target on social media, particularly for women, if you have a, um, a strong personality. And I just, it's, I, I don't understand why it has to be that way. I think one of the things that's probably saved you through all of this is your sense of humor. <laughs> 
and your ability to see the bigger picture, of course. Uh, I remember reading an article where a reporter said that all of the media loves you because of your great wit <laughs> and your loose tongue. Well, see? That, and it is loose. It and is ever thus loose. Uh, to this day, to this hour, I'm trying desperately to behave on this interview, Carol, for you. Um, but, uh, oh no, I mean, I have a potty mouth. There were two places I never swore. One was in front of my mother, and the other was in the legislature, because it's forbidden. Um, but it was very hard for me other times to uh, keep my... Um, extreme language under control. Uh, I did mature a little bit uh, and uh, would uh, get through long interviews uh, and scrums without um, swearing. But um, I never took myself too seriously. And there are some times where you just have to say to the media, are you kidding me? You can't take yourself too seriously. Talking about saying what's on your mind, you talked about having platonic mind sex <laughs> with Pierre Pettigrew. <laughs> How did that work out? There, there were two things in my career that my mother was so horrified about. Um, that was one. The other time was, of course, the prancing penis. That crossed the legislative floor to yes. the other side. Yes, and that was in the days, uh, it, it, it was one of those wind-up toys. I will say, just to premise, uh, preface that, this story, that uh, the sale of wind-up penises skyrocketed after that incident, and they were sold out. I had a judge uh, call me from the interior and say, I need four. Can you help me find uh, where I can get four? But that was an incident where the women of the legislature, both uh, the opposition women, um, it, it, opposition MLAs, the government MLAs, and the media uh, women would get together one night a year uh, when we were sitting late at night, when there was round-the-clock sittings. And um, it was a lot of fun. It was very collegial, and we relied on it. Everybody in the legislature relied on it. Um, and uh, uh, the incident of taking this toy, which was not my toy, and uh, taking it into the chamber very inappropriately um, became a part of those uh, celebrations. And it was stupid. It went... It went international, how stupid that was. You then decided uh, it was time to leave politics, that you'd done your best, and you decided that's enough? Well, it, it had to do with being in opposition and living in the fear of that for not doing my job uh, well enough uh, as opposition. Uh, so four years of that, I was physically exhausted at the end of it. I was in my mid-50s, uh, early 50s. And I was physically uh, devastated. Uh, so um, I, I could not have run again. I, I just didn't have the um, uh, physical well-being to run again. You call yourself a socialist, by the way? Social Democrat. OK. So but I, I don't mind people calling themselves socialists at all. I support people who are socialists. So a social democrat, you've worked uh, in labor, you've worked in government, and Within two months of leaving government, you find yourself in Hollywood <laughs> with this glamorous <laughs> wedding to this fabulous film producer. What a clash of styles. <laughs> right? Yes, a Hollywood wedding in Bel Air, gorgeous home of one of our friends. And Hollywood, the people attending from Hollywood were fascinated by the politicians from British Columbia and the political class uh, of my friends were fascinated by uh, the Hollywood people who were there, that many of them they recognized from TV and movies, etc. So it was great, uh, and it's been great ever, the, ever since. One thing that characterizes you and your profession is you like challenges. So someone comes knocking on your door and says, Joy, um, ICBC's in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> 
And you said yes, <laughs> you would take it on? Yes. Uh, John Horgan, Premier, new, newly elected Premier of, in 2017, called me up and said, um, I've got two bags of uh, a swear word. My mom wouldn't want me to use that swear word. And he said, which one would you like, Joy? And I said, well, what are they? Because I had been out of politics for a long time, and my uh, interests were elsewhere. I mean, I still supported my party, but I wasn't paying attention day to day to what was going on in the British Columbia politics. And he said, well, they're BC Hydro and ICBC. Which one would you like? And I went, oh. And it wasn't uh, John's Irish charm. He's put it in the form of a question, but we know it really wasn't a, a, a question. Uh, I said, well, I had ICBC at one point as min responsible as minister. I'll, I'll uh, take ICBC. And little did we know that it would be such a struggle to uh, change ICBC top to bottom, and we did. So describe the situation when you came in and first saw the books at ICBC. It took us three years of intense effort, gradual change uh, to uh, ensure that when we made the final change, getting um, rid of a tort model, that it was the last possible change that was needed. We tried everything beforehand. And today, um, the company has a almost $2 billion surplus. So for all of your tremendous work and contribution, you have received the most important award lately. It's on your lapel, the Order of Canada. Congratulations. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. I'm joining your, the great order that you belong to as well. It's a real honor. What does it mean to you? Uh, it's, it's um, when it was described to me as the highest civilian honor, it really kicked in that there's the whole system of honoring people in the military, the medals that people wear. And this is a very special medal for honoring ordinary Canadians who give back to their country uh, outside of the things that we're paid to do. Congratulations. Thank you very kindly. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This was great. To Joy, as you can see, the concept of retirement is foreign to her. Following the recording of this interview, she wrapped up her term as chair of ICBC and literally the next day took on the role of board chair at BC Ferries to address a range of challenging issues. Oh, and she also joined the board of directors of a development corporation, and who knows what the future holds for her. It'll be interesting to watch. Joy McPhail, a BC legend.